You may wish to pause the recording at this point in order to read the problem statement and come up with your own uh, method of attack for solution. Okay, so in this problem, we've got a turbine with an adiabatic efficiency of 0.9. We're given the pressures between which it's operating, the mass flow rate through the uh, turbine, the temperature at the inlet, and also for uh, something new, we've got the temperature and pressure of the environment here. We've been asked to do several things, including sketch the uh, TS diagram to calculate the power out of the turbine, the rate of irreversibility in the turbine, the lost power uh, from the turbine, and finally, we've been asked to calculate a quantity which looks quite a bit like an efficiency. So let's start out with part A, the TS diagram. So the TS diagram that I've drawn here actually has two exit state points because we're dealing with a, a turbine with an isentropic efficiency of 90%. So the pretend turbine, that if it were operating reversibly between 1 and 2 with no heat transfer, would end up there at state point 2S. The actual state point at the exit of the turbine has got the same pressure, but a bigger entropy because of the entropy generation. So there's state point two for real. The isentropic efficiency is a measure of how those two exit points compare to each other compared to the inlet point. So there's our TS diagram. To calculate the power out of the turbine, we're going to use good old conservation of energy for the system consisting simply of the turbine itself. I throw a conservation of energy at it, making the standard assumptions. It's steady state. We have no heat transfer. It's adiabatic. No kinetic and potential energies. And I solve that for the power out of the turbine. Now, as you've seen before, when we uh, use conservation energy for a turbine that's not ideal, this actually will not give us the power, because even though I know the mass flow rate and I have enough information to find the enthalpy at state point 1, H at 2 is unknown. So this is one equation, but two unknowns. So I'm going to put this on hold and come back to it after I look next at conservation energy for the isentropic turbine. Okay, so we're going to write the same conservation energy between 1 and 2s instead of 1 to 2. That conservation energy looks like this. The advantage of this, of course, is that I can find state point H2s because I know both the exit pressure at state point 2s as well as the entropy, the entropy being the same as at state point 1. Okay, so let's take a look at finding those properties for change. So let's use our good old um, ease uh, property finder to find these properties. So in this problem, we'll just take a, a minute to look at the use of those electronic steam tables. Okay, so at 1, we're given the pressure as 8 megapascals and temperature as 700 degrees Celsius. Let's take a look at this guy. So let's get into the SI system here. My stuff is steam. We'll make the temperature 700 degrees. We will make the pressure 8,000 um, kilopascals, which is the same as 8 megapascals. And that gives us an enthalpy of 3881 and an entropy of 7.28. Let's plot the TS diagram just to make sure that we are superheated. Yep, look at that. Way up there. There's our state point at the inlet of the turbine. Definitely superheated. Okay, so those are my uh, properties at state point one. Okay, while I was there, I also looked up S1, and this is the information that I am going to use to find the state point H2S. So at state point 2S, I know the exit uh, pressure, 100 kilopascals. I know the entropy is the same as that as the inlet, 7.28 kilojoules per kilogram. That should give me 2646 kilojoules per kilogram. Let's make sure that that's the case. So the pressure at the exit, 100 kilopascals. Entropy at the exit of the ideal turbine, 7.28. Let's calculate that. There's my enthalpy, 2645.6 kilojoules per kilogram. And I plot that and see that, in fact, state point 2S is underneath the vapor dome. Okay. It is a saturated mixture. There's the quality right there, 0.99. Just barely a saturated mixture, but a saturated mixture nonetheless. That's how I find H2S. 
Hopefully you're getting pretty good at finding properties at this point, and you're getting adept at using these additional tools like ease or the property calculator to find the properties, instead of having to use the steam tables all the time and doing countless interpolations. In any case, I use those values to find the isentropic power out of the turbine, paying uh, careful attention to my units as always. It's uh, 1,545 kilowatts. Next, I use the isentropic efficiency of the turbine, which is the actual power out of the turbine divided by that isentropic efficiency, or I'm sorry, the isentropic power, which I just calculated is 1545. And I find that the power out of the turbine is 1390 kilowatts. Very good, so there's the power out of the turbine. Let's move on to the next part of the problem, which asks us to find the rate of irreversibility in this turbine. So refresh your memories, irreversibility, we uh, defined as the temperature of the surroundings multiplied by the entropy generation rate inside the turbine. So to calculate this, all I need to do is find the entropy generation of the turbine itself. Here's the system I'm going to use for that. It looks like the previous system. You'll notice that I did not uh, draw an arrow indicating the power out of the turbine because for entropy accounting, I don't need that. Entropy can be transported across system boundaries via mass or heat transfer. Entropy is not transported with work or power. And there's something new. Notice that inside the system, I have S dot gen. I like to draw a little lightning bolt for that. Um, and it occurs again inside the system. It is not something that crosses a system boundary. So when I look at my accounting of entropy, unlike the other equations that I saw in ConApps, which are all for um, conserved quantities, I have this guy right here, which occurs inside the system. That's a system boundary. That crosses a system boundary. That crosses a system boundary. This one is inside the system. Major difference. In any case, I make the standard assumptions. This is steady state. It is adiabatic. There's only one inlet and one exit. So this very quickly reduces to the entropy generation rate as the mass flow rate times the change in entropy between the inlet and the exit. Now, when I look at this, I realize that I have a little bit more property work to do. I know S1 already, but I don't know S2. I never bothered to find that. But I can find it based on the fact that state point two is known if I know the exit pressure, which I do, and the exit enthalpy, H, H2, H2 coming from conservation of energy, the equation that I left behind. Okay, so I'm going to go back to conservation of energy for the real turbine, and I'm going to solve it for H2. So solving for H2, it's equal to H1 minus W dot out divided by the mass flow rate. I have all of those numbers. Plug them in, get H2 is 2769 and S2 is found at a pressure of 100 kilopascals and the real exit enthalpy of 2769, that is 7.597 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. And so now I have all of my exit properties, H2 as well as S2. I can plug S2 and S1 into my entropy generation, find that it is 0.3956 kilowatts per Kelvin, and then I multiply that by the temperature of the surroundings, 300 kelvins to get my irreversibility. Okay, so take notice of one very important piece of this calculation. That temperature of the surroundings must, absolutely must, be in uh, kelvin. It cannot be degrees Celsius. Whenever you see a temperature by itself, chances are uh, that you need an absolute temperature scale and not a relative one. Okay, so in any case, I have just a a little bit under 119 kilowatts worth of irreversibility in this turbine. Okay, and the next part uh, asks us to find the power that was lost in the turbine. In other words, what was the power that the turbine could have produced but didn't because of irreversibilities? This calculation is not really a calculation at all. This is much more of a conceptual problem. Hopefully you recognize that the lost turbine power is exactly equal to the irreversibility. Okay? That, in fact, that's the interpretation of irreversibility. It's lost uh, power or it's lost work, depending on whether you're looking at um, steady open systems or closed systems over finite times. Either way, 119 kilowatts worth of power that the turbine did not produce, but it could have. 
And last, certainly not least, I've been asked to calculate this efficiency, which is the power out of the actual turbine divided by the power out of the turbine plus the power that could have been produced by the turbine, the lost work, or the lost power. So you'll recognize the bottom there as the maximum power that could have come out of the turbine. Um, don't confuse that max power with Homer Simpson's pseudonym of max power. But anyway, I digress. So we have all the numbers we need for this. This is a pretty simple calculation. I've already got the actual power out. I found the lost power. I divide those two numbers, and I get an efficiency of 92.1%. Uh, now, going back to the problem statement, I'll see that I have an isentropic efficiency of the turbine given as 90% you might be tempted to say that those are the same and I just made a round off error somewhere. But that's not the case. Those are actually different numbers. Okay, the question is why are those different numbers? Because in fact, doesn't the isentropic efficiency measure the same thing? The actual power out of the turbine divided by the power out of the turbine if it were reversible? Well, yes, it does, but there's a major difference between these two efficiencies, and it has to do with the exit state point. So the isentropic efficiency measures the actual power, which happens between 1 and 2, and the power that would happen between 1 and 2s, the exit state point being the same pressure, but a uh, different temperature because it's reversible and adiabatic. This epsilon guy instead, however, measures the difference between the actual power between 1 and 2 and the power that could have been produced between 1 and the actual exit state point 2 if it were a reversible process. So going from 1 to 2 reversibly is what this maximum power on the bottom represents. Okay? So 1 to 2s is reversible and adiabatic. 1 to 2, the actual state point, cannot be both reversible and adiabatic because then it would be 2s. So what you'll see here is that this maximum power between the actual state point 1 and 2 is something that cannot be adiabatic. There is heat transfer associated with this maximum power that can occur between 1 and 2 for real. So that's a subtle difference, but it's a very important one, and it's one that we'll return to as we explore this uh, wonderful and wonderfully interesting property called exergy.